Hello and welcome to the Smart Money, Dumb Money Show. And I'm your host, as usual, Keith Richards. And I'm president and chief portfolio manager of Vitron Wealth Management. And I'm a technical analyst. But today we're not going to be talking about technical analysis. We're actually going to be talking about the economy. And this is something that, because I am not an economist, I brought a very, very special guest with me today. And I'm, I can't tell you how excited I am to have Maxime Bernier today on the show. Um, just before anybody draws any conclusions about what this, this video is going to be about, it is not a political <laughs> discussion. So it's a nonpartisan discussion. We're here to talk about the economy, but Maxime has a, a deep, deep background in um, economics. Um, I'm just going to quickly read from his, uh, his uh, resume, so to speak. But before that, I want to mention that the first day I ever met Maxime Bernier was on a coffee shop on John Street in Toronto. And uh, it was just before my BNN show at the time. And uh, so uh, Maxime was at the time uh, vying for the PC leadership. This was 2017. And, and he and I met and um, the Simcoe uh, board of directors, I was a member. Uh, for the Conservative Party at the time, and Alex Nuttall was our, our guy, uh, our MP. And he said, oh, you got to meet this Maxime Bernier, because uh, he said, oh, you guys have a lot in common. So I met with Max. And what was really interesting is that M when Max and I sat down, and he said, oh, I just flew in from, where was it, Sudbury? I think it was Sudbury. Yeah. And Maxime said, you know, I was talking to one of the, the unions and they were asking me um, to repeal uh, the, it was a, I can't remember the, the act. I'm sorry, Maxime. It was, a, it was a union disclosure agreement that during your Harper era, um, you had helped formulate um, where the union bosses had to tell them what they were spending the money on. And the union was sort of hinting around, I guess, to you at that time that they would like you to reverse that. And if they did, they would buy PC memberships and vote you in. <laughs> and you said you just wouldn't do that. And I, I learned at that time that Maxime Bernier is a, is a person of very, very high integrity. And he's a, he's a good guy, too. Like, we had lots of good conversation. We both like uh, uh, Ayn Rand and all that sort of stuff. So I'm it's... I'm bringing Max on because he's he's got a deep background in finance, but he's also a, a genuinely good person of high integrity. I'm, I'm a big fan of Max's. Um, and so I, let me just quickly introduce uh, his background. Um, a lot of people will know who he is, uh, but uh, basically he's been, he was with the PC party. He was chair, chair of the National Defense Committee, Minister of Foreign Affairs, uh, Minister of Registrar General, whatever that is. <laughs> I actually don't know what that one is. He's, uh, of course, been a long time uh, MP in, um, in Bo Bo Boos? Buse? Bose, Bose. Bose. Okay, Bose. All right. Um, he's got business degree and legal degree. Um, he's not a part-time drama teacher, but he, he does have those degrees. So, uh, And he's worked in the past in law, finance, and banking. So, uh, Maxime, welcome to the show. Thank you, Keith. I'm very pleased to be with you. And uh, yes, um, I watch what you're doing and you're doing a good job. So, but our first, like you just said, our first uh, uh, meeting together was downtown Toronto. I, I remember that. And the bill that you, uh, that we spoke at that time, you know, the upper government, and I was a minister uh, with the upper government at that time, we passed a, a bill for more transparency for, uh, 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 for the, uh, the union, union dues. And we wanted the unions to be more transparent to, for their members. And that bill passed. And, uh, and yeah, I had a meeting with a couple of uh, union bosses and they told me, absolutely right. And you know, we will support you for your leadership contest. It was in 2017. I wanted to be the leader of the Conservative Party of Canada, like you said. And but you need to repeal that bill. And I said, no, I believe in more transparency. And that's it. So and I just want to go on with that story. Uh, after the election in 2019, uh, when <clears throat> I think no, in 2015, uh, the Trudeau government repealed that bill and work with the big bosses from the unions 
And uh, right now, you know, that was a good bill, but it's not in force anymore. So that's a little bit sad, but that's the reality of politics. So I'm pleased to be with you. And, uh, you know, I'm, <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a politician, but also, like you said in the beginning, I worked in the private sector, in the financial sector for 19 years before being in politics. Um, <clears throat> I was elected at 43 years old in 2006. But before that, uh, I was a VP of a bank in Montreal, National Bank, uh, VP of an insurance corporation, Standard Life. And, uh, and you know, I was also VP of the Montreal Economic Institute. That's a, a free market a think tank like the Fraser Institute in BC. So uh, yeah, I, I, like the, I like economy, I like... Uh, uh, businesses. And when I decided to be in politics, it was at that time for a smaller government uh, that will respect the constitution and more free markets. So thank you for having me today. And I'm, I'm pretty sure that we'll have a, a, a very nice uh, conversation together after all that time. Yeah, well, this is this is great, Maxime. And, and free markets are what the stock market are all about, So, uh, or they should be about. So um, I'm actually going to start off with, you know, the people that read my, my blog and watch my videos know that uh, I've literally been all over the inflation thing since 2020. Um, we get to, at Value Trend, we take a bit of a bow here uh, because we, when, uh, way back when, uh, they, were, they were calling both sides of the border for inflation to be transitory. Uh, we called BS at the time and uh, we stated it on my blog through my videos. And, uh, and basically, uh, we were right. And we traded commodities, made a lot of money. We sold them all early this year. And, but we are still saying that we think we're, we're going to be trapped in an inflationary cycle, even if it's not 7% anymore. It might be 3 or 4 but it ain't going to be 2% anymore. And therefore, there's different things we have to, to uh, invest in. So Maxime's not going to talk about investing. But I'd like to you, Maxime, to give a background on where we are and why we have the inflationary situation that we're in right now. Yes, uh, first, I must say, Keith, that you were right and you are right about the inflation when the central bankers were saying that, you know, not only in Canada, in Canada, in US, in Europe, they were all, all saying the same thing, that the inflation is transitory. And you called it at that time, you said, no, it will be there for a long time. And yes, you are right. And the inflation will be there for a long time. We have inflation everywhere, not only in Canada, in Europe, in the US, in Canada. And we have inflation because, you know, uh, <clears throat> with COVID-19, we must start it there. Uh, COVID-19, all these uh, uh, establishment governments in uh, Europe and in US and Canada decided to uh, say to their people, stay at home, we will shut down the economy and we'll give you uh, uh, checks, we'll pay you for staying at home. And as you know, all these governments didn't have the money for that. So they had a huge deficit and that these deficits were monetized by central banks. So in Canada, our central bank, the Bank of Canada, but uh, our Canadian bonds and the same thing in other countries. So for me, inflation, it's always because of a bad monetary policy. Uh, you know, if you have the uh, same, uh, uh, same uh, amount of, of money or, or in circulation and you don't increase uh, the, the, the monetary, the money in circulation, and the production, it's about the same, you won't have inflation. Maybe a price of one good will go up, but the price of other good will have to go down. So you won't have a general inflation. And we had that inflation in Canada because of the huge deficit, $450 billion. And, and now we are paying for that. When Trudeau uh, did this deficit, uh, people were saying, oh, maybe that would be bad for our children and grandchildren. They will have to pay for that. And at that time, I say, no, we will have to pay for it. And yes, our children, but we will pay by the inflation tax. And now we have that inflation tax, about 6.9% here in Canada, in the US, about 7.1%. And that's why we have now interest rates that are raising in Canada and in US, 4.25% here in Canada the interest rate coming from the Bank of Canada in US about 
and that will that will continue to rise and the bank of canada and the fed uh, are in a very difficult position because if they <laughs> increase the interest rate uh, that will <clears throat> i believe will have a, a recession a very strong recession because you know in these uh, governments us and in europe and in canada we have huge debts but also the private sector and individuals so everybody, uh, government, uh, private businesses, individuals, uh, everybody uh, have a huge debt all across the world. And so that's why if they increase the interest rate, they will create a recession and we may have a stagflation. And if they don't, we will have inflation, maybe not like you said, around 7%, but for sure more than two percent and uh, right now I, I look at the study coming from the bank of uh, not the bank of canada sorry from statistic canada in our country and statistic canada said that the average increase in income in our country in canada this year will be about four to five percent so if you have seven percent inflation everybody will will be poor by two percent so that's why inflation is a tax. So we have that inflation to answer your questions because of bad fiscal policy. And, and because of that, central banks printed a lot of money out of thin air. And that's why we have inflation. So, and I believe that like you, the inflation may be there for a couple of years. Yeah, it's, it's amazing, uh, Maxime, because a lot of people, uh, and, and we, uh, we, we promise not to get political, so I won't get too political here, but there's a lot of excuse making as to why we're in the, the pickle that we're in. And the fact of the matter is everything, if, if you know, I'm a technical analyst, so I, I look at stock charts and I look at price patterns and volume and all that stuff. But even I know the basics of economics and the basics are supply demand. I mean, I think it's like page one, first day in class, you know, you learn supply demand, right? So, you know, we're, if, if you've got supply of money and, and ongoing demand, then you now have too much on the supply of money and less of the goods, you know, more money chasing less goods. And that's really the pickle that we're in. And, and it's amazing that, that anybody would suggest that by printing more money to fight inflation, and we're not going to say who just did that, but <laughs> we know who just did that, um, that, that that is going to, you know, give away all the free dental or whatever you want. Like it's, it's adding, it doesn't maybe add to the inflation that month, but it's, it's, you just dumped a bunch more of that supply of money into the system. It circulates. And before you know it, inflation is sticky and it sticks around, you know? Yeah. So, yeah. Like you just said, more money chasing fewer goods, you have inflation. And actually, one government in Europe uh, uh, understand that, uh, Sweden. Sweden, they published their budget in November, uh, I believe the last week of November. And so they said, we need to fight inflation. And we are serious about it. So <clears throat> the central bank over there did raise interest rate, and they will. And they said, the politicians said, we must work uh, with our central banker. And at the same time, so that's why we will balance our budget. And next year, they will have a surplus. So, you know, wow. it, it, because, because of that surplus, they, they will help uh, the, the, the central bankers because their central bank won't have to buy uh, bonds. So that will help. They won't have to create more money out of thin air. And that's the only solution, real solution to fight inflation. You must have fiscal responsible uh, policy, balancing the budget, having surplus. So they will have a surplus next year. And they are saying in their budget, we will cut that, we will cut that mm -hmm. expenses. And they have a list of expenses that they will cut to balance the budget. And so that's great. And the central bank over there is serious also about it. So I believe that in Sweden, they may not have inflation for the next five years and they will be able to fight inflation. But here in America, in US, in Canada, as you know, the US is still have a huge deficit. And for that, uh, the Fed will have to monetize uh, the, the, the deficit and they will do it. 
So the politicians here in, in, in Canada and in US don't help central bankers to fight inflation. No, it's, it's, uh, it's crazy. You know, uh, I just actually read, as you just said, um, I just read a stat on the, the debt servicing in the States, and I'm sure it's very similar in Canada, um, but the debt servicing is so intense that basically they can't, they, they're in a position where it's almost uh, inconceivable that they won't be printing more money, just, you know, paying Peter to what are they? What is the expression? Paying Peter to pay to when you owe Paul or whatever the expression <laughs> yeah, is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah. they're they're to to keep up with what you know that because of the the debt servicing costs, it's it's gotten out of hand even to a point where forget the debt, forget the debt. <laughs> it's yeah. the it's the debt servicing costs. But it, it, it's the same thing. Uh, same thing, uh, Keith in Canada. Uh, you know the interest on our national debt in Canada at the federal level. Uh, if you look at the last budget, it's about uh, $25 billion. So $25 billion, it's about the, the budget of the national defense in Canada. So, but because of the interest rate that are <laughs> higher than it was a year or two years ago, uh, next year, it may double and only to pay the end on our debt in Canada will be about 40 to $50 billion. So imagine what we can do with that money. We, you know, we can be generous. We can have good social programs, but no, we will have to use that money to pay only the interest on our debt. So it is irresponsible. And in the U.S., it's the same thing. It, the, that amount in a couple of uh, years will double, and, and that's why the situation is very, very. Uh, difficult, and it, I, I believe, like you, that uh, that recession that we have may be a stagflation because I don't believe the Fed or the Bank of Canada. You know, the Bank of Canada said we uh, increase our interest rate at 4.25 percent, and they said that may be the last increase because they know if they go if <laughs> more than that, uh, that the recession will be will be Guaranteed. very bad. Yeah, yeah, very deep and bad. And it's the same thing in the US. So I believe that these central bankers will stop and, and, and will have that inflation. So yeah. it's, uh, it, it, it's sad, but that's the reality. There's not, there's not something, there's nothing as a free lunch, like we said, we have yeah. to pay for that. Yeah, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to bring you uh, to a point you just brought up. It's something that actually it, it falls along the lines of what you're talking about, um, which is the idea of stagflation. So I'll, I'll ask you to explain to the viewers what stagflation means. Um, and maybe I'll let you just carry on without my two cents. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's, it's having a recession at the same time with inflation. And, you know, if uh, central bankers were serious, they would have to increase interest rate by more than a couple of points. And the best example of that is what happened in the 1980s uh, when we had a recession at that time. Uh, we, I remember that we had inflation at 12% at that time. And to fight inflation at 12%, you need to be sure to have a positive interest rate. So the Fed in US and the Bank of Canada they had to raise uh, at that time interest rate to 17, 19, 20%. Uh, and, and the inflation was at 12%. So today we have an inflation around 6.5, 7%. And our central bankers in US and Canada <laughs> will stop maybe at 5%. So we won't be in a, in a real positive interest rate. And that's why I believe that we'll have stagflation will have a recession with inflation. And that was, if you look back in our history, after the Second World War uh, in the 1940s, we had inflation for 10 years. That was the way to pay for the debt during the war. And I believe that will be the same thing. We'll have inflation for the next couple of five or 10 years. Uh, and it would be very difficult for central bankers to keep uh, inflation at 2%. Uh, it may go down from 6.1 or 6.9 to 4, 5, or 3, but it would be very difficult because 
<laughs> our government in Canada and in US, they are still spending more money than they have, and they are still, still creating deficit. And, and that's more money chasing fewer goods, the inflation will be there. Contrary to what I said in the beginning with Sweden, that they decided to balance the budget and have a surplus, that will help to kill that inflation over there. Yeah. Well, the, the, the problem with, with politics is that somebody's got to be the adult and, and, and being the adult, just like when you're, you know, you've had kids and you know, and your kids are young and they say, I want the chocolate bar as you walk through that damn supermarket <laughs> checkout. They always put the chocolate bars right at the kid's eye level. So he or she says, I want the chocolate bar. And if you give the chocolate bar, even once from that point on, you're going to get, you know, you, you, the kids are going to scream until they get the chocolate bar. So, yeah. um, and that's but, the issue of, of what you're talking about is you want to be fiscally like Sweden did. You're going to have to be the adult in the room. And then there's going to be some screaming and crying when they don't get their chocolate bar. So, yeah. And, and, and politicians uh, uh, like to buy uh, your votes with money that they don't have and yeah. you know they like to please you and you know they're looking at the short term just to be elected and that's a big difference with between them and us at the people's party you know we have strong policy and we are telling the truth and it may not be popular today but we believe that the more we speak about an idea the more that idea will become popular because it's all about common sense and if you look at our platform, that's common sense. So we believe that uh, we want to appeal to your intelligence, not to your emotions, but traditional establishment politicians like to give you what you want. They're doing polling and focus group and survey, and they are telling, telling you what you want to hear, and they are throwing money at you to be sure to have your vote. And for us, we, we don't play that game, and that's why we are very different. But yes, that's the that's politics, and and it's for me, a tough word about it. <laughs> yeah, for, for me, the best compliment that I have is when somebody is telling me, Maxime, I'm looking at what you're saying, and I'm following you. You're not a real politician, and for me, for me, it's it's a nice compliment because yes, you know, we we don't wait until something is popular to speak about it. We believe that uh, you know, our strong ideas on the economy, on other subjects will become popular because we will speak about it openly with passion and conviction. Well, it's, it's interesting. The, uh, the, the um, equivalent is, you know, as a technical analyst and a, and a trader, we, we look at the, the general populace of investors as very myopic. And, and this is what we're talking about, right? I want my chocolate bar now. Um, but you know, we, we, we also view the populace as very a technical analysts. We, we study things like market sentiment and, mm -hmm. and we, we look at if, if a crowded trade, we'll sometimes call it. it, it, it so, so when, when uh, everybody's emotionally involved with believing that, I don't know, everybody's going to have an electric car within three years, then everybody buys Tesla stock as they did three years ago. And now <laughs> Tesla's roughly half of, <laughs> you know, yeah. this is how emotions work. Uh, you know, you, you get excited by an idea and that could be, you know, printing money, but I want to just carry this forward. So let's, let's say we both buy in, by the way, I do buy into the idea of a probable stagflation environment. So stagnant growth and, and uh, with, you know, three, four, whatever, 5% inflation. So, and for the reasons you explained, um, and I'm, I'm glad you explained that, but I wanted to uh, cover something. Um, we, we are, for the first time at Valuetron, we're, we're, we've never been gold bugs, but we have been adding gold over the past little while. Technically, the charts tell us that it's a good place to be right now. But you, I know you, you, have, uh, you have some ideas about, about gold in general, just as a currency reserve and all that sort of thing. What are your, your thoughts there? Do you have any thoughts there? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. For me, I don't want to give any financial uh, advice. No, no, you're not. <laughs> yeah, but, but uh, I can tell you that uh, I'm looking at what is happening right now. And I, I know that central banks are buying a lot of gold in Asia, uh, Russia, India. And because I believe that, you know, the time for the US dollar to be the only international monetary unit that everybody is using for their transactions, uh, may end. I don't know when, but you know, just look at what is happening right now in uh, Saudi Arabia. 
uh, you know, the, the president of China was there a couple of days ago, and, you know, they want to have a new, a new deal together instead of buying uh, uh, gas and oil by paying with US dollar, they want to, they, they try to have another currency that will be the competition of the US dollars. And what the US did in the war in Ukraine, they, they, they used the, the monetary system to punish uh, Russia. And so a lot of other countries are looking at that and they don't want to be too much dependent on the US dollars. And with the, the, the Fed printing money out of thin air like that. So I believe that the, in the near future, it can be in five years, in 10 years, that we'll have competition to the US dollar. And maybe that new monetary unit may be based on gold or, or commodities or, or both. So we don't know. But if we look at the history in the 19th centuries, we had a kind of a gold standard and everything was going well at that time. So I believe that it may come back. And so we'll see. And uh, it, for me, it's a question of time. Uh, actually, uh, the, the, the dominance of the US dollar is a question of time. So yeah, that, that, excellent. Because uh, I had another guest who's a bit of a market historian. And I know you're not an investment advisor. You're not, you, this isn't about an I'm not going to give you an investment question. <laughs> I'm, going, I'm going to I'm going to um, give you a question regarding, like you just mentioned, the U.S. dollar, and I'm 100% on side with that. In fact, that's why we started buying gold, as well as the technical look of yeah. the chart. But beyond that, um, you know, th th this market historian we had on, um, he was talking about long, long cycles where different societies, different civilizations, become the dominant and the you know, and fall out of grace and all that stuff. And uh, so one of the things that came along was the, the, the BRICS, like the, the, the emerging markets, China, you know, India, whatever. Um, what are your thoughts on, not from an investment point of view, but from a world perspective, where, where do you see the US's strength? Yeah, well, yeah, absolutely. You're right. If you look at the history, uh, a fiat monetary money, a fiat currency, can can be good for 100 years, 150 years, and after that something happened because the government are creating too much of these uh, dollars right now uh, out of thin air. So uh, I believe it it may happen it, and it will happen, but I don't know when. And yes, with the BRICS, uh, uh, you know, Brazil, Russia, India, China, and and South Africa, they are looking together and they are serious. They want to have their uh, international transactions in another currency. And if they are doing that, that would put pressure on the US dollar also. And uh, so uh, absolutely, we are in a, in a very challenging or exciting time, if I can say like that, because all that may change in the next 10 or 20 years. And we are in the middle of all that. So it's very interesting. And I hope that this change will happen uh, without any too, too bad uh, impact on our standard of living, but it may. So that's why when, you, when you're speaking about gold personally, uh, usually gold is to keep your purchasing power. Uh, and, that, that's, and in a time like that, I can understand that more people are buying gold just to be sure to keep their purchasing power. And as you know, if you buy gold, you won't have any interest. You are not, it's, and in time like that, I can understand that uh, people are looking at gold and uh, to protect their, their future. Yeah, that's actually uh, one of the studies that I've done and I've presented on my blogs uh, in the past and talked about this a lot is that gold has actually got a, an almost perfect negative correlation to, uh, to the US dollar. I mean, a lot of people think it's a hedge against the stock market or a hedge against the economy. It's got some inflationary hedge qualities, but really it's a, it's, it's a dollar hedge. It's a US dollar yeah. hedge. It's yeah. almost perfect. It eventually moves in the opposite direction, even, even if it's delayed by six months or a year. So I, I think if, if we, we all, anybody that has a view that maybe the US dollar has extended too much, and that is a view that I certainly have, then it's you know it's another way to start hedging against that that possibility of a declining U.S. dollar. 
So, um, okay, so I'm gonna just finish up with one last question. And the last question is, uh, you know, given the stuff we've just talked about, the debt, the inflation, um, investment, productivity, and growth in the Canadian economy, specifically, rather than talk about the U.S., like, what are you, you know, what are your thoughts over the next few years? I know you've mentioned we gotta, we gotta have that Swiss, you know, way of looking at things where we keep, we, we control our debt and all that, but maybe that doesn't happen uh, for a while. So, so you know, wh where do you see the risks and where do you see, you know, as far as the, our economy goes? Yeah, I believe that in Canada, you know, there's a lot of natural resources uh, in our country and, uh, you know, uh, gas, oil, and uh, also uh, rare, um, rare, um, how do you call that? Um, rare metal, rare... Oh, precious metals and and uh, rare earth, whatever they call it. Yeah, rare, rare earth. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and so, so I believe that the the future of our economy uh, that will help our economy is on natural resources, and that was that in the past. That would be that in the future. Uh, people will need our oil. Oil. Uh, they will need also our uranium, and it's we we have a lot of natural resources. So I believe that in the near future. And also the Trudeau government or another government, uh, because we may have a recession and a stagflation, they will be more open uh, to, uh, to new projects for uh, exploiting our natural resources. So I think, I think that's, that's for, for our country, that's, that's very good that we have that. Uh, I must add also that our central bank in Canada doesn't have any gold, and that's the only central bank uh, that doesn't have any gold. So that can be a challenge over there because like I said in the beginning, central bankers right now are buying gold and but more reserve of gold knowing that the international monetary system may change. So that can be a challenge for our country. But that being said, I believe in people. I believe in free markets. I don't believe that the government is the solution. I believe usually the government is the problem. So. Uh, if we can have more free markets, if we can uh, reopen our economy, lower our taxes, but we cannot do that right now. We need to be serious about balancing the budget. And after that, that's our position, the position of the People's Party, balance the budget. And after that, with surplus, uh, lowering our taxes. So if we can open the windows and more free markets, and the big challenge that we have right now in our country, it's health care. You know, uh, it's um, we have a lot of uh, waiting times for surgeries, and we need to have more uh, private delivery in healthcare, and that may happen. That's uh, that's a big reform that we must do in our country. We are the only national political body that is proposing that. That's the only solution to have a healthcare system that would be more efficient. Like in Europe, actually, they have a mixed system with private delivery and public delivery, but everybody everybody has a universal coverage and i'm not speaking about the u.s system so we can have that in our country and i believe that it will come so but politicians need to understand that and right now they are not we are the only party that is speaking about that so we have a lot of challenges but i'm uh, i'm optimistic for the future if we are taking the right uh, doing the right public policies well, I, I agree with you 100%, Maxime, uh, your comments that Canada is actually in a great position. I've been talking about this for a while. Uh, we've, we've been uh, divesting a lot out of uh, the United States. Then we still have U.S. stocks, but, you know, Canada has the resources. And you're right, it's, it's kind of a, it's, it's a forced issue. Like, we're, we're going to be forced to by natural causes to to actually have to utilize that our resources and yeah. you, you said it yourself uranium chemical those kind of companies they're producing what is needed to make this clean energy in the future the lithium batteries or the rare earth and all that so this is yeah i agree with you 100 percent, and uh i really appreciate you coming on today and i think this has given us some real economic background as to how we have to posture ourselves as both people and citizens yeah. and investors. So thank you for coming on. But thank you, Keith. I was very pleased to have this opportunity to be with you and I appreciate what you're doing. 
And as you know, our role, and I think my role as a politician to try to inform the population and bringing forward the best policies for a smaller government in Ottawa that will respect our constitution, will respect people, will have more uh, choices. So that's the People's Party. And if I may add, if they want to know, if your viewers want, want to know more, they can go on our website, peoplespartyofcanada.ca, read our platform. Actually, it will be the same one when the next election will come at the federal level. We, we don't change our platform. It's always the same one. We are fighting on principles. So uh, I hope that your viewers, if they like the platform, you know, when the time will come, they will know what to do. <laughs> but I want to thank you, Keith, for that opportunity. Thank you, Maxine. Thanks for coming on. Have we'll, a nice day. Hopefully catch up again soon. <laughs> oh, yeah, for sure. Okay. All right. Bye-bye. Hi, once again, and this is an after the fact uh, video that I'm recording at uh, the end of my interview with Maxine Bernier. I just wanted to make a quick note uh, in that I interviewed Max because, in my opinion, he's an extremely honest person with a very, very high level of integrity. And he's got a very deep background in finance. Uh, he's, he's got a deep understanding of economics uh, and education and, and work history in the field. He's a, he's a guy that has a, a brilliant mind, in my opinion, and I wanted to feature him on the show for his opinion on the, the, the economy and uh, not just the Canadian landscape, but the worldwide landscape, and I think he did a good job. So this video wasn't a declaration of my support of the People's Party of Canada or for the progressive conservatives or any party in particular. It's more a video with an interview of a person who I think can offer us real insights. And I think he did that, particularly when it came to the currency talk we had. So I hope you enjoyed it. Thanks for watching and we'll see you next week.